Welcome to Construction Genius. My guest today is Kelly Thanel, the CEO and president of Executive Financial Services. Kelly is an expert in ESOPs. Let me give you a quick analogy he kicks into right at the beginning. Executing an ESOP is like executing a complex construction project. There's risks involved, but those risks can be mitigated with excellent planning, great communication, and patience. So today we're going to go into the details of an ESOP. Who should do an ESOP? Who shouldn't do an ESOP? Why you should do an ESOP? And everything concerned with executing that ESOP over a period of time. Kelly's an expert. Check out the links in the show notes for all of the resources that he mentions. Let's dive right in. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Kelly, welcome to Construction Genius. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Terrific topic here today. We're going to go ESOPs. I know it's something that most construction companies at least consider at some point as they're looking to transition their business. It's a proven strategy to um, tap into the wealth that you've created through your blood, sweat, and tears. So I'm glad you're here just to dive into the details. I just want to kick it off right away. What challenges arise when original owners seek to cash out through an ESOP? Well, I think the biggest challenge probably, Eric, is understanding what an ESOP is and how it works. When I talk to uh, business owners and they ask me, what are the the major negatives about ESOPs? The first Mm -hmm. thing that I tell them is complexity. And so, uh, but people in the construction industry are in an industry that's complex. Yes. You're building a building and it's a complex process. And Structuring an exit plan, including an ESOP, is a similar process. Uh, uh, starting with a set of plans and then putting the building blocks together. And so I think that the, the first challenge is, is being patient and dealing with the complexity and getting on the learning curve. And it's a pretty steep learning curve because of the inherit uh, complexities of an ESOP. So let me give you an example of what I mean about the complexities. First, you know, the question is, what is an ESOP? And the answer to that is that it's two things in one. Uh, First, it's a qualified retirement plan for a company's employees. So it's not too dissimilar to a 401k plan, which is another form of qualified retirement plan. But with an ESOP, there are three key differences that make an ESOP more than just a retirement plan. The first difference is that an ESOP can borrow money. The second is that an ESOP can engage in certain transactions with parties in interest. And the third difference is that an ESOP is required to invest primarily in the stock of the sponsoring company. So if you take those four things, an ESOP is a qualified plan that can borrow money It can use that money to buy stock from the existing owner or owners. And then that stock becomes an investment in your employee's retirement account. And so when you consider that an ESOP is a qualified plan with those three key differences, it is two things in one, a retirement plan and a liquidity strategy uh, for the company's current owners. Okay, so I think that is actually one of the best explanations that I've actually ever heard of an ESOP. Well, thank you. That's terrific. So we're creating this entity that can borrow money, buy stock from the original owners, and that stock then becomes an investment. Yes. So an ESOP is a tax-advantaged way for a company 
to or for an owner to sell his or her company to their employees yep. in, in a normal sale directly to those employees to a management buyout, uh, the tax burden on that makes it virtually impossible. Yes. But with an ESOP, Uncle Sam is pitching in approximately 40% of the cost of the transaction. Mm -hmm. And Uncle Sam is doing that to encourage companies to take better care of their employees and to share ownership with yep. them. They, yep. The government sees that as a worthy goal. And I think most people in our society see that as a worthy goal. So it's interesting. You, you, you draw a very good analogy. Most of the people who are listening to this program have built tremendously complex construction projects. With complexity comes risk. And that requires a tremendous amount of upfront planning. The more we plan, the more we understand the project, the more we can mitigate the risk and achieve a successful outcome. So as we begin to go through the planning process, what are some of the main risks that a person should be aware of as they're thinking through and building the foundation for a successful ESOP? Well, I think the major risk is the debt that's being assumed by the company to finance this buyout of the owner. And so as a result of 43 years experience in this <laughs> business, I've learned, I've been through the ups and downs. We did four ESOPs in 2008, before September 15th, which is when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt that year. And so one of the key lessons from that was to avoid or to mitigate risk by being very conservative mm. in the way the loans are structured. Mm. And so if a business owner thinks that they could comfortably borrow uh, two times their adjusted earnings from a bank and service that debt over a five-year period, then if they want to be ultra conservative, perhaps they borrow one time or one and a half times current earnings, mm. or perhaps they go to the SBA for a po portion of the loan and the SBA, instead of loaning money for a five-year term, which is generally the maximum that a commercial lender, such as a bank will consider, the SBA will loan that money over a 10-year period, which reduces the annual debt service dramatically. So managing the bank debt and uh, structuring it in as conservative a way as possible is the first thing to do to manage risk. So, so let, me, let me interrupt you there, if, if I may interrupt you there. So using again the analogy for construction projects, if I'm on a tight schedule, that then increases the, the risk because uh, you know I could make mistakes in the building, I could have safety issues. So when it comes to then the analogy of the ESOP as it relates to a construction project, what kind of consideration do I need to give to the exit timeline of an owner as it relates to how the ESOP is executed? How much time typically should an owner give for that full transition of the ESOP? There's not a, a standard answer that, you know, is consistent from, from company to company, but as a general rule, five to eight years. Okay. And so, um, I am, even though I'm an ESOP consultant and this is all that we do, <laughs> I'm not one of these people who has a hammer and therefore thinks that everything is a nail. Right. And I don't think an ESOP is the right strategy for every business owner. So if you have a business owner who's looking to sell his company, take the money and run, an ESOP's probably not the right strategy because an ESOP is a gradual exit for a business. Mm. So Very good. most of our business owners tell me uh, that their work is their life and that their wife told them that they married them to have lunch, I mean, to have dinner and not lunch. Yeah, right. Most of my clients want to stay involved and active in the business, maybe in more of an advisory, the day-to-day -day operational role, but they want this kind of gradual exit. Yes. And so if they're looking for a five to eight year exit, then an ESOP can work 
really well. So that's probably the best kind of standard time frame for uh, exiting a company. If, if it's somebody who needs to take the money and run, go to the beach, and, and not ever think about the company again, then they should sell to a third party and not to an ESOP. One of the challenges that sometimes comes up in ESOPs from the discussions I've had over the years is that the difference in perception between the original owners and the employees who are going to become owners in terms of who's getting the better deal. So sometimes the employees will have a sort of a sense of suspicion or um, even resentment can come up, particularly if it's not clear what's actually going on. So how do the, the, the best transitions occur that deal with that kind of tension? You know, you're absolutely 100% right. When I started in this business, I naively thought that a business owner would explain to the employees that they've done an ESOP and they now own the company and everybody at the end of the meeting would come up and give the business owner a hug and say, yeah, right. doesn't right. work like that. It takes time. And so there is no instant solution to that challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes constant communication so that the employees understand what the ESOP is and how it benefits them. And it's not just enough to tell them. They need to see that in action. So I'm a huge believer in establishing realistic expectations. Yes. And I tell business owners to expect it to take at least three years till the employees really begin to understand and appreciate what you've done for them. Because as complex as an ESOP is to a business owner, it's much more complex to the person in the field who's not a business person by education or by profession. Sure. And so it takes time, it takes constant education, and then the tipping point occurs the first time one of their coworkers gets a check from the ESOP. Right. You know, some of the other things that we do is um, if we have a company that's in a similar industry, we'll sometimes have um, employees from that similar company that's had an ESOP for five years do a video testimonial yes that we'll present uh, to our new clients employees so that they can hear it from somebody who's in their position right you can go to youtube and find those kinds of testimonials of people who have uh, participated in esop there's there's one gentleman who says that having an esop is like having christmas twice a year there's December 25th, and then there's the middle of the year when this company's employees get their annual ESOP account statements, uh -huh. and they see the value of what they're going to have in the future as a result of their ESOP plan. So there are lots of, lots of things to do, but I think your focus on the educational aspect of this and the communication to the employees is critical. So... So does that entail forming a ESOP committee? Does that mean you're going you're gonna to charge one or two key people with becoming the ESOP experts? How is that done well? I think that's a, a great first step. And one of the things that I encourage business owners to do is have, uh, you know, some people who are in senior management or, um, who can learn about this process beyond the committee. But the other thing that I do is, I advise them to take the most skeptical of their rank and file employees and put that person on the committee because it's the committee members that are going to learn the most, the soonest about what the ESOP is and how it can benefit them. And if you can have that person who's the most skeptical uh, with his or her peers in the field talking about, no guys, this is a real deal. And this is really going to benefit us. And so have some friendly people from the employee group on that committee, but also have your greatest skeptic because the greatest skeptic even will become a believer. And the message coming from them is more effective than the message coming from the business owner or from senior successor management. So with, with that in mind, 
as you're considering that, the ESOP is a long haul. And we're talking about communication, but what other strategies can be used to keep employees engaged in the ESOP process during the early low value years? Now, there are a lot of things that we see our clients do that are very effective. Um, our clients have stock reveal meetings mm -hmm. where they essentially have a celebration uh, of the uh, statements that come out each year. Your point is very important, Eric, that in the early years, the value is going to be low because the company has all of the ESOP acquisition debt on its balance sheet. And so if you had a $10 million company that sold uh, to the ESOP, the equity value of that company a year later might be a million dollars mm. because the company is fully leveraged. But the growth rate on that stock is going to be phenomenal because they're going to benefit not just from the organic growth rate of the company. Mm -hmm. or let's say the company's earnings increase by 5%. That would be its organic growth rate. But that ESOP participant might see an increase in value of 15% because not only did they enjoy the organic growth, they also enjoyed the increase in value that resulted from the payment of debt. And so with a 401k plan, you have one source of growth for your account. Mm -hmm. With an ESOP, you have two sources of growth and together mm. they're very powerful. So we really focus not just on what value is in your account, but the account's growth rate from year to year, which typically is significantly double digit type growth. Okay. So then the financial aspect of the transaction is obviously tremendously important and making sure that people understand the timeframes that are going to be involved. How do you deal with the cultural transaction and the, the cultural transition? Because let's say you have a company that's owned by one or two people and those guys or gals, they're the bosses, they've made all the decisions, they've built the company, who they are has driven the culture and now there's going to be a transition. And the person who is going to at some point step into the president role or the CEO role is not going to have the same ownership stake and therefore the same fundamental decision-making ability. How does that dispersion of ownership relate to decision-making processes as it relates to running the business on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, there, there are really two questions. Um, yeah. In, in your question. So first, let's talk about culture because companies where the owner is concerned about maintaining company culture after a transaction are the best candidates for an ESOP. Mm -hmm. You sell to a third party, that third party is going to tell you after we buy the business, nothing's going to change. Yeah, right. Is the second biggest lie in the world. <laughs> what they own you, it's going to become their culture, no matter what they tell you during the, the courting period. Sure. Well, after the marriage and they own you, uh, they're in control. Yep. So where a business owner is really focused on protecting not only their employees, but also their customers. Because one of the biggest problems when you sell is your existing customer base doesn't like the new culture any more than your employees do. So if you want to protect your customers and your employees and by maintaining the company culture, an ESOP is the most effective way to do that because it's a form of an internal transition. External transition means a change of culture. Culture internal transition means you have the opportunity to maintain culture. Now, in terms of decision-making after the process, uh, the rules of corporate governance that applied prior to the ESOP are going to continue to apply after the ESOP. And what that means is that for the most part, the decisions are going to be made by the company's board of directors. And that board of directors, in our experience, generally is the selling shareholder as chairman with the CFO 
as a member of the board. And then the person who is going to succeed the seller as CEO of the company, uh, also on the board. So that that person can witness firsthand the owner's thought process and decision-making process in running the business. So if we have an owner that's going to transition out over five years and is going to remain chairman during that period of time, we want the person who's going to be his successor next to him while the selling shareholder is making those decisions. So, so, that, so does that mean you, that you've already identified your successor prior to executing the ESOP or is that something where people can sort of figure it out as they go? It works best if they've already identified the successor. So um, this process is really two things in one. There's a management succession piece and an ownership succession yes. piece. Very much. Best if the management succession piece has either happened or is in process uh, when we do, when we use the ESOP to do the ownership succession piece. So will you ever say to someone, let me, yeah, let me ask you that then. So will you ever say, say to someone, they come to you and you're consulting with them and you can tell that they don't really have anyone in place. Would you say, listen, go away for two or three years, develop a few folks, and then let's talk again? Absolutely. Right. Uh, I always tell business owners that the best candidate for an ESOP is the company where the boss comes in late, takes a long lunch, and leaves early because they've already done succession. The, the boss is, the founder of the company has gotten over that micromanagement phase and has raised up uh, successor management to do the functions that he or she does. It's not a requirement, but that's where it works best. But you need to have at least identified one or two people who are going to serve in that successor role. And so uh, if you've already got the successor in place, that's best. If you've identified one or two people who you can bring along as you're being paid out, that's second best. If there's nobody on board who has the potential to succeed, then you're not a good candidate for an internal succession, including an ESOP. You need to sell to a third party. So then would thinking about an ESOP, you know, it's, it seems like it just kind of hits people in the head like five to 10 years before they want to get out of the business. But from what you were saying, Kelly, if, if you're going to consider this ESOP strategy, it's something you should be thinking about 20 to 15 years maybe before you're even out of the business. Yeah, I think five years uh, would be best. A couple of years would be helpful. Um, and a lot of people don't think of, I'm going to do an ESOP, and so I need to start doing management succession you yeah. know, five years ahead of time. They have thought at some point in the future, I'm no longer going to be running this company. So I'd need to have a management succession plan. And then once they have that in place, they start thinking, okay, now I need to think about the ownership succession piece. And so uh, that's when they start thinking about the ESA. Okay. Quick break to talk about my book, Construction Genius. And let me tell you why you need to buy the book, especially if you're thinking about an ESOP. You've got to have the right leadership in place who will be able to take the company over from you and lead the next generation of success and ensure your legacy. And so they need to be experts in terms of leadership, strategy, sales, and marketing. And my book is a terrific platform for that expertise. So go out to Amazon, purchase a copy for yourself and all of the leaders in your organization read one chapter a month, get together with your leaders and discuss that chapter and how they're going to use and apply the information. Cause I guarantee you that they can use and apply the information very effectively because it's very straightforward. It's very simple. And it will hit right home with the practical stuff that your leaders are going through every day in your construction business. So go to Amazon, purchase copies, and I know you will tremendously benefit from the book. All right, let's get back to the interview with Kelly. I'd like you to think about one company. They don't have to necessarily be one of your clients, but let's say there was a company whose ESOP failed. 
They had the best intentions. They did the communication piece, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Why was that? We, we've had two over 43 years that have failed. Yes. Two out of how many companies? Oh, hundreds. Okay. So good, good ratio. Yeah. In 1% failure rate. Okay. Uh, but we're only, I mean, we, of the business owners I talk to, I tell at least half of them that they're not ready. Good. Good. Excellent. And, and so um, we don't want work with companies unless they have a very high chance of this being a successful transaction. Absolutely. Uh, our business is is very strong, and and we don't need to to entice people to do something that's not right for them because yeah. we don't have enough business. Um, yeah. oh, we're really focused on working with companies that uh, are com where the owner is committed to the future, and so the one that failed, the, and this was thirty years ago, mm -hmm. uh, was a business owner who. Had gone through some some family and life kind of transitions, mm. and he had been married for a long time, got divorced, married a younger woman, that alienated the children. He had had another business that he had sold and made a lot of money from that. Then did the ESOP and thought. I'm going to the beach. So he mm. was a business owner who wanted to take the money and run. And if I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have wanted him as a client. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that was 30 years ago. And so uh, if you have a business owner who uh, is really focused and committed to the future uh, and is going to stay active in the business, you can avoid that type of problem. So what are the first one to three steps a person should take if they're thinking about looking into ESOPs and getting familiar with them? First, have a conversation. And we're happy to have a conversation with a business owner. They often involve their CFO. Sometimes they involve uh, their accountant or attorney. And we're happy to talk to them about what an ESOP is and how it works and answer their questions. So that's step number one. Step number two, if there, if an ESOP seems to be of interest, is then get educated. Right. And so you can do that by going to our website. We've got a lot of educational materials or going to the websites of the two industry associations, uh, the National Center uh, for Employee Ownership mm -hmm. and eo.org has a great website with lots of educational materials, some of which we've written yep. for the CEO. So go there, uh, do some studying, talk to other people uh, in the industry who have done ESOPs. And if you don't know anybody, we'll give you names. Yep. And then if it still looks like a viable strategy, hire us to do a feasibility analysis. And in that analysis, we'll do all of the modeling. It'll take about two months to do all the work. And we will produce a decision document that will give the business owner all the information that they need in order to decide if this is the right strategy. So I think those are the, the three first steps. And with that in mind, what would you say are some of the key financial characteristics of a strong ESOP candidate company? Great question. Uh, I tell people that uh, ESOPs are for uh, small to mid-sized companies. They're not for micro companies. So over the last uh, three years, we've done 25 ESOP transactions. Just to give you a sense of the yes. metrics, please. Smallest one was a company that had adjusted EBITDA of 1.2 million. The largest was a company that had adjusted EBITDA of 56 million. Hmm. And the median was a company uh, that had adjusted EBITDA of 4 million. Hmm. Interesting. So, so, so that's interesting because you, you would think that, so these companies aren't necessarily massive then. 
some ESOP companies are, but most of them are. Most of them are yeah. mid size companies. I mean, there was, you know, the accounting firm DDO last year, which is a massive company. Right. Sold 40% of the firm to an ESOP for, you know, over a billion and a half dollars. Yep. So there are massive ESOPs that are done, but the core of the ESOP market is companies with two to, f- to four million of EBITDA. That's the heart of the ESOP market. And so, so I think uh, yeah. as a rule of thumb, you need to have at least a million, preferably two million. On average, our clients uh, have about 95 employees. Our largest client had 2,200 uh, and the smallest one, about 20. So with that in mind, as you're pitching that, the, uh, the, the ESOP to employees, how does that then, how do you then present it to them in terms of a retirement plan for them when perhaps they'll need more money other than what the ESOP can provide? Well, we always encourage companies to continue their 401k plan. Okay. After they adopt the ESOP. Uh-huh. Um, and ESOP is the ultimate undiversified retirement plan. Almost all of the ESOP value is tied up in company stock. Yep. And that's completely contrary to sound investing principles. Yeah, right. So employees need to have their 401k mm-hmm. on top of the ESOP. Okay. And the 401k plan is extremely diversified. So you really need those two things working together. But in most situations, the ESOP provides uh, in 20 years a much larger benefit than they're going to get from uh, the 401k because ESOPs on average companies contribute three times more. On average, uh, the typical company puts 4% into uh, its 401k plan, and the statistics indicate that ESOP companies contribute uh, 10%. So and that's interesting. Yeah, please and go yeah, ahead. You're going to finish, yeah. Great, because of this leveraged rate of return. So it's important then as you're communicating the ESOP in the early years, so to speak, to to not oversell it and to make sure that people understand that this is a a, a part of their retirement strategy, and not the whole thing, but that over time, they'll see that, that significant impact of it. Correct. What we do, uh, because life is all about managing expectations. Yeah, right. <laughs> We, what we do is if the CFO tells us that a reasonable growth rate for this company is 8%, mm. then when we communicate to employees, we'll show them what their account could look like at an 8% growth rate, at a 4% growth rate, and at a 0% growth rate. Right. So that not only helps us manage expectations, it helps them understand the value of them working harder and smarter right. and make the company grow faster and how that will directly benefit them, not just the founder, but them as well. So it's interesting as, as again, you're, you're beginning to think about an ESOP and you're the owner, how does an ESOP help to mitigate the risks associated with having a majority of a business owner's net worth tied into the company's equity. Yeah, it uh, helps them diversify. Hmm. Uh, so they're going to get cash out of the transaction, uh, which then they can invest in a much more diversified portfolio. And most of our clients are investing very conservatively. And they're investing in things that produce an income will provide them retirement money. And then they're also going to have this promissory note from the company, uh, which is going to have this very high rate of return that I described earlier. Since that debt is subordinate to the bank's debt, it's going to have about a 12% return on it. Mm. So it's a great vehicle for liquidity with the opportunity for the owner to diversify and for ongoing income for the business owner because of this great return on the selling debt. Um, going back to what you mentioned earlier about the that one ESOP that failed and there were some family dynamics involved there, 
How does an ESOP address the challenge of providing for both active and inactive children in a family-owned business? Yeah, so the classic example would be a situation where there are two children, one's active, one's not. And the dilemma has always been you don't want to leave stock to the inactive child because that's a, a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And so a better approach might be to sell 49% of the company to the ESOP. A founder invests that money and leaves that to the inactive child. The founder leaves the 51% uh, uh, to the active child and probably can give that to a trust or to the child directly now at a sharply discounted valuation. Going back to our example, if we had a $10 million company, and in the prior example, we were assuming a 100% transaction. So immediately after the transaction, that company's value might be $1 million. If we we're doing a partial transaction, then maybe that company's value is four or five million dollars. And so we could gift that 51% to the child for this deeply discounted value for estate and gift tax planning purposes and really achieve that equity between the two children that most parents want to do, while at the same time reducing their estate and gift tax burden. Okay, so that's an important point to make is that the ESOP doesn't have to be 100%. Correct. In your experience then, what is the ratio of e ESOPs that are 100% versus some other kind of percentage um, as far as the transaction is concerned? It depends on whether we're talking about existing ESOPs because for the first 30 years ESOPs were around, most were not 100%. So we uh -huh. have that historical uh, situation. But of the new ESOPs that are established, 80% of them are 100% transactions and 20% are less than 100%. And that's not, that's our practice, but that's the ESOP world in general. Is your preference to go 100%? I don't have a preference. I mean, my goal is to do what's best based on the business owner's goals and their financial situation. So I don't have a preference. So we're, we're completely agnostic. Uh, we're driven by a uh, bottoms up process that's based on the company's financial situation and the business owner's goals. Final question here before we wrap up. One of the biggest incentives that construction company owners have in terms of selling their business is to stop signing their name on contracts. And <laughs> yeah, you, you get the recognition there, Kelly. Yep. yep. How does that dynamic work when it comes to who gets to sign, who's going to be responsible? Um, when does that transaction transition happen? And what does that look like in terms of an ESOP? Yeah, the biggest concern that I see is the personal guarantee on the surety. Yeah. And so most of our construction company clients, and so this year we're going to do 12 ESOP transactions and four of them or for construction companies. Yep. Uh, we've got a lot of the experience and that's a big part of our market. Yep. Uh, and in each of these clients that we're working with, they're already in the position where they no longer have to give a personal guarantee on the surety. Okay. So if you're in that situation, that's great. If you're not in that situation yet, you need to get there before you do these. Um, so perhaps this is the opportunity to sit down with your broker and say, look, we've been doing this for 30 years. We've got a, a pristine record. Uh, I'm no longer going to be the owner of the company and the successors don't have the assets that the surety company would be interested in anyway. Let's get to work and get us off the personal guarantee. If you can't do that, then you're probably not a candidate for an ESOP. That's so interesting, right? Because, you know, the, the, the surety folks are looking at you and saying, you know, the construction company owner, dude, the only reason that um, your business is where it is is because of you. And so that's exactly why I want your guarantee. So it's so interesting to think through how 
you have to structure your business in advance and not just make sort of a knee jerk decision that, oh yeah, and the ESOP's going to be a way for me to, to get mine, so to speak. Yes. Agreed. Okay. So again, you've, you've, you've told us a little bit more, a little bit about yourself as we've gone through the process here, Kelly. Um, tell us a little bit more about how people can get in touch with you, why they should get in touch with you and any resources that you have available. Sure. Our website is execfin.com, E-X-E-C-F-I-N.com. On there, you'll find lots of educational materials. The first thing that you'd want to do is download uh, our ownership succession guide. You'll find that on the first page of our website. That's a free download, and that will repeat much of the information that we've discussed today. It'll have a description of the ESOP basics. You'll also find on our website a link to Amazon where you can purchase a book that I've written on ESOPs. There are other books out there, but most of those were written for lawyers and CPAs and investment bankers. Yeah. Well, I'm a CPA. I mean, an attorney and my partner is an attorney. I think we've bridged the gap of being able to discuss this in plain language. And that mm. was really the purpose of the book. Yeah. And so there are a discussion of ESOPs. There are six or seven case studies. Because mm -hmm. I think that's how business owners learn best is yeah. about thought a case study that's similar to theirs. Yes. And seeing what happened. And then you have to have all of the obligatory legal descriptions in there. But instead of doing that as a legal treatise, I did it in the form of Q&A. Mm. And so if you have a particular question, don't read the whole 100-page ESOP technical stuff. Right. Go to that question and get your answer. Excellent. Excellent. So we will have links in the show notes to, to all of those uh, resources that you just described. Kelly, as we're signing off here, Give us one or two pearls of wisdom for someone who is considering an ESOP and wanting to get into it. Learn about ESOPs, uh, and I've, I've discussed how you can do that. Be patient mm. with complexity Yes, uh, that's involved, but any exit strategy that you look at is going to have a complexity. And be sure to work with someone who focuses exclusively on this area. This is not something that you could do on a part-time basis. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who has the, the legal background to do it and somebody who doesn't think that everything is a nail because they had a hammer. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've got to be able to, I, I appreciate the fact, Kelly, that you're willing to tell people no. Yeah. That's so important because, you know, it's so easy just to say yes, 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 and then get into all kinds of trouble. So I appreciate that, Kelly. Appreciate you coming on the show here today, sharing your wisdom. And I, I know it's tremendously benefit, uh, beneficial to my audience. So thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much, Eric. Take care. Thank you for listening to my interview with Kelly here today. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, sh check out the links in the show notes for everything that Kelly talked about in terms of how you can get in touch with him and the various resources that his website has. You should check out the website. It is comprehensive. They've done it very well. There's lots of free information so you can get comfortable with what an ESOP's all about before you engage with any consultants. But thanks again to Kelly for coming on the show. Give the show a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. I'll catch you on the next episode.